Hello, this is Andrew Schwartz, and I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to check out this presentation for doctors on deducting professional expenses. I hope you will find this information to be helpful to you as a practicing healthcare professional. Once again, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm partnered with my brother Rick Schwartz in the CPA firm of Schwartz & Schwartz, based in a suburb north of Boston. Our practice focuses on the accounting, tax, and basic financial planning issues affecting healthcare professionals and their practices. Let's talk about what's deductible. For an expense to be deductible, it must be both ordinary and necessary in connection with your profession. So let's say that you buy a smartphone that you're gonna use pretty much 100% with your business. Well, I would say that that qualifies as ordinary and necessary. But what if you buy a coach carrying case for your mobile device? You might think that qualifies as ordinary and necessary, but I'm sure that the IRS might disagree. You probably hear all the time from your friends, your family members, your colleagues at work about some of the crazy things that they deducted last year. And then they always tell you, well, what I deducted must be okay because the IRS never disallowed any of my deductions. Well, in my office, when, when clients are trying to describe these crazy things that they heard from other people about these deductions, what we tell them is simple. We just say, you want to know something? Everything is deductible until you get audited. So which types of expenses are deductible? Here's a list of 16 expenses commonly deducted by healthcare professionals. What we're going to do in the next few slides is discuss certain of these expenses in greater detail. The first is automobile expenses. Deductible mileage includes driving between job sites, driving to a temporary job site, and driving to conferences or interviews or other business related activities. What's not deductible is driving between your home and a regular place of business. There's two ways that you can deduct your automobile expenses. One is based on the standard mileage rates. All you do is you take the total business miles driven during the year and you multiply that by the standard mileage rate. For 2013, the standard mileage rate is 56 and a half cents per mile. So let's say you drive 1,000 business miles during the year, you multiply that by 56 and a half cents you come up with a deduction of $565. The second way to calculate your automobile deduction is to base the deduction on actual expenses incurred. In this case, you first have to calculate the percentage of miles driven during the year that were business miles. So you take the total business miles driven during the year and you divide that by total miles driven per year. Then you multiply that percentage by the actual expenses incurred, which includes gas, insurance, repairs, parking at home, lease payments if you lease your car, or a factor for depreciation if you own your car. Now what we normally find is that unless you drive very few miles during the year, with most of those miles being business miles, you're better off claiming the deduction on the standard mileage rates. The next expense is computer equipment. Now this used to be a bigger deal when computers cost a lot more money and weren't the disposable item that they pretty much have become. Um, but to be able to deduct the cost of computer equipment, the computer must be purchased as a requirement of your employment and for the convenience of your employer. So if you purchase a high powered computer so you could work at home instead of saying, staying late at the lab, uh, in theory, that would not qualify as a deductible purchase that year. So now let's talk about education, examinations, and licenses. Here's the rules. Anytime that you do something that improves your skills in your current trade or business, that would be deductible, the cost associated with that activity. Anytime you do something that qualifies you for a new trade or business, that would not be tax deductible. That's why you can't deduct the cost of your medical school as a business expense, dental school, law school, um, and you generally also can't deduct the initial cost of licensure in the first state where you become licensed. Any license renewals or the cost to become licensed in a second state would be deductible.
Let's take a look at some of the higher cost education programs which would be deductible to healthcare professionals. For starters, a physician enrolled in an MPH program, I would say that all those costs would be tax deductible. A practicing dentist enrolled in a dental specialty program, the IRS has ruled that all those costs are tax deductible. And a mental health practitioner paying for psychotherapy as part of their training to become a licensed psychotherapist, all those costs are tax deductible as well. Next we have insurance. Insurance is pretty easy. Malpractice insurance and insurance on your business assets is tax deductible. Life and disability insurance is generally not tax deductible. Let's discuss per diem rates. Here, the IRS actually made our lives easier. When you go on a business trip outside the general vicinity of where you live, the government gives you the option of claiming the expense for your meals, entertainment, and incidentals based on a daily rate per city. So when you go on a business trip, you're given a choice. You can either claim the deduction for your meals, entertainment, and incidentals on the actual expenses incurred, which means you just tally up all the receipts and all the money that you spent during the time that you are away on the business trip. The other option is to use the per diem rates. And as I said, every metropolitan area is, giving, is given a rate by the federal government. And all you need to do is you take the daily rate and you multiply it by the number of days you're on the business trip, and that's a per diem rate. So let's say you went to Chicago and the rate is $74 a day, and you went there for five days. Well, what would happen is you just multiply the five days by $74 a day, and you come up with a $370 deduction. Now, whether you claim your deduction on actual expenses incurred or on the per diem rates, the amount that you can ultimately deduct is usually limited to 50% of that amount. Now, if you go on multiple trips during the year, you can use both methods of calculating your deduction for meals, entertainment, and incidentals. However, you need to be consistent by trip. You can only use one method per separate trip. To find a listing of all the per diem rates, the federal government uh, maintains those rates on a site, gsa.gov. So if you go on the link that's on this page, you will find all the metropolitan areas with all the applicable per diem rates. Let's talk about temporary job assignments. This is a potentially huge tax deduction if the situation is right for you. Basically, any time that you live and work in one city and then you move to a second city for a year or less with the intent of returning back to the first city to work, you treat the time in the second city as one long business trip. That means you get to deduct the cost of all your travel, lodging, and your me meals based on the per diem rate for the whole time that you're away. It's really, it's a great deduction and I see it pop up maybe in three, four, five tax returns a year, but if the situation is right, don't overlook the temporary job assignment deduction. The last deduction that we're going to discuss is the home office deduction. Back about 15 years ago, the government actually made it easier for someone to claim the home office deduction. Prior to the rule change, you could only claim the home office deduction if you perform the income producing activity within the home office. So what that meant is if you were a doctor, you basically had to treat your patients within the home office to be able to claim that deduction. Under the new rules, you qualify to claim the home office deduction if you use a portion of your home on a regular and exclusive basis in connection with performing administrative and managerial tasks for your trade business or profession. Regular means it's used throughout the year and exclusive means it's used for no other purpose except for the home office. If you do qualify to claim a home office, how do you calculate the deduction? Well, for starters, the deduction is based on square footage. You'll figure out the square footage of the home office, you divide that by the square footage of your total home, and that percentage is a percentage of the expenses that you can claim. If you're a homeowner, you'll claim that percentage of your mortgage interest and real estate taxes, which are already tax deductible. 
You also claim that percentage of your utilities, your insurance, your repairs and maintenance, and you also get to depreciate a portion of the home. That means you get a deduction each, each year based on the home's original cost plus improvements. If you're a renter, the home office's deduction is great because rent isn't otherwise deductible on your federal tax return. So if you're a renter, you'll claim a portion of your rent, your utilities, and your renter's insurance um, as part of the home office deduction. Now I do want to point out that there's a new simplified calculation for the home office deduction. And the simplified deduction is very simple to calculate. All you need to do is you claim the amount of square footage that you use for the home office up to 300 square feet in your home and you multiply that by a statutory rate of five dollars per square foot. Claiming your professional expenses can definitely help you save some taxes. Let's say that you're compensated as an independent contractor where you do some moonlighting and you're paid as a 1099 or you do some consulting and they just pay you straight. In that case, you can take your professional expenses that weren't reimbursed during the year and you deduct those out-of-pocket professional expenses directly against your 1099 or your moonlighting or your self-employment income. And in this example, let's say you earn $20,000 during the year with no taxes withheld. You're able to come up with about $8,000 of expenses. You'll only be taxed on $12,000. The $8,000 will directly offset the $20,000 of income. If you're compensated as a W-2 employee only, you don't get nearly as big of a bang for your buck, but you can still deduct your professional expenses as an itemized deduction by first completing a Form 2106. Since you can save some taxes by claiming your professional expenses as a deduction, you want to set up a system to keep track of those expenses. The best system to set up is, you, is to use a personal finance program such as Quicken, or mint.com. With either of these systems, um, you get everything set up correctly and it keeps track of all the checks you write during the year and all your credit card transactions. And all you need to do at the end of the year is press one button, it'll generate a report and it'll put your different professional expenses in the proper categories as you set everything up. A second option is to use an a Excel spreadsheet that's available on mdtaxes.com which is a website that I maintain. Um, the Excel spreadsheet has a, a lot of preset expense categories, basically the 16 categories that are listed at the beginning of this uh, presentation. And it has a column for each month. So all you need to do is, is every month you put the expense that you incurred in the correct column, it tallies everything up for you, and at the end of the year, you have a good handle on your professional expenses. The third option is to use a separate credit card for all your professional related expenses. And if you use a credit card that at the end of the year provides you with a nice summary that breaks down all your credit card transactions by category, um, since you're going to use a credit card just for your business transactions, that summary should provide good backup for you to be able to figure out your professional expenses during the year. Finally, the least best way is to set up a separate file, a separate folder, and just place canceled checks, credit card receipts, other receipts and invoices in that folder throughout the year. And at the end of the year, you just tally up the different expenses that you incurred by category, and you figure out your total amount of professional expenses incurred during the year. Thanks again for checking out this presentation today. I hope you found it informative and hopefully some of the suggestions will help you save some taxes. If you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at andrew at schwartzaccountants.com or you can go to mdtaxes.com and there's a forum where you can post your questions and one of the MD Taxes CPAs will get back to you as soon as you can. So thanks again.